Hi, I'm Randy Wise, curator at the Fremont County Pioneer Museum in Lander, Wyoming, and welcome to our latest Wind River Visitors Council virtual adventure trek. Today we're going to be looking at historic Main Street of Lander. We're going to be looking at some of the historic buildings that are still standing. That's what we're focusing on today is buildings that are still there. Many of them have changed a lot over the years, but we're going to look at some historic structures in the early days of Lander mostly along Main Street. There are a couple of exceptions, like the building behind me, the library, and a few others off of Main Street, but they're significant and we're going to talk about them as well. We're not going to be going in any chronological order today. We'll be jumping around in history a little bit from the early 1880s to the 1920s, but bear with us and enjoy. The valley of the Middle Fork of the Papoja River has been home to people for thousands of years. Native Americans from many tribes lived and hunted here and it was a favorite area for the Eastern Shoshone and their leader, Chief Washakie. When the Wind River Reservation was established in 1868, Washakie chose the Wind River country as his home. The first white people in the valley were fur trappers in the 1820s, and hundreds of thousands crossed the emigrant trail over South Pass near the valley, but the first permanent white settlers were gold miners who left the faltering gold mines and moved to the valley to become farmers and ranchers. Washakie wanted a military fort to protect his people from his traditional enemies, so a small post called Camp Brown was established in the valley in 1869. Two years later, the boundary of the reservation was moved north, as was the fort, which was renamed Fort Washakie. The Papoja Valley was open to settlement. Sitting on the freight road between the gold mines and the rapidly growing fort, a town, originally called Push Root, began to grow. General stores, livery stables, blacksmiths, a hotel, restaurants, and saloons were built to serve the freighters, miners, soldiers, and farmers. The first buildings were of logs, adobe blocks, or rough-hewn native lumber. Later, brick kilns supplied bricks for more substantial structures, but windows, doors, and furnishings had to be hauled by freight wagon from railheads at Rollins or Green River, a 150-mile-long arduous trip. When the first post office was established in 1875, the little community was renamed Lander in honor of Frederick Lander, an Oregon Trail engineer and Civil War general. The town was designated county seat of Fremont County in 1884 and officially incorporated in 1890. The town grew slowly until 1906 when the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad arrived. Then between 1907 and 1920, the town doubled in size and became known as where the rails ended and the trails began. This building, built in 1894, was known as the Knights of the Pythias Building, also the Free Silver Bar, the Bank Exchange Saloon, and the Arcade Saloon. Social organizations were important in frontier settlements and Lander had a number of Masonic groups. The Lander chapter of the Knights of Pythias built this two-story stone building in 1894. It had a large hall on the second story where they could meet. On the lower level, there were a number of saloons over the years. Orson Grimmett owned the Arcade Saloon and the Free Silver Saloon located here. The Bank Exchange Saloon was also in this building. Grimmett was sheriff of Fremont County twice and also acted as deputy sheriff. He was deputy at the hanging of James Kiefer for murder, which was the only legal hanging in the county. Grimmett kept the noose, and it was on display at the Arcade Saloon for many years. The noose is now at the museum. The Federal Building and Post Office, Lander's historic old post office on North 3rd Street, was completed in March of 1912. The population of the town then was about 1,812 people, and the city was growing extensively with the arrival of the railroad. The plans for this building were extensive, including, at the back of the building, hitching racks for mail carrier horses and mail wagon teams. It took nearly two years to build this fine stone building. Construction began in June of 1910 and was completed March of 1912 for a total cost of $150,000. In the early stages of the planning, the Public Affairs Committee of the Lander Commercial Club wrote to the supervising architect to say, the Lander area has marble, granite, and sandstone that would be suitable for the proposed new building. 
but the federal government vetoed the local building materials and instead Vermont granite, Bedford limestone, Denver brick, Chicago terracotta, Philadelphia structural steel, Oregon lumber, and barrels of white Portland cement imported from France were all transported to Lander by freight train. It is a beautiful structure of granite and brick. In the basement there were restrooms for the male employees of the post office, a fuel room, an engine room, and storage rooms. The Wyoming State Journal reported in the basement the clerks have shower baths and everything tending to comfort and health. The rooms in the basement were furnished as high class as any portion of the building. The post office was assigned the entire first floor. On the second floor was the United States Court and officers of the court, the U.S. Marshal, U.S. Attorney, Clerk of Courts, jury rooms, and restrooms. The building was wired for both electric, lights, and gas and had two telephone systems. The U.S. Weather Bureau also had rooms that were the entrance to the roof where the equipment could be reached. Weather was monitored from the top of the federal building for many years. The lamps on the outside of the building lit it up at night. The building of Lander's beautiful public library was put into motion when Andrew Carnegie gave money to towns to build public libraries. In 1901, Carnegie, at the age of 66, was known as the world's richest man. Andrew Carnegie's life was a true rags-to-riches story. Born to a poor Scottish family that immigrated to the United States, Carnegie became a powerful businessman and a leading force in the American steel industry. Lander banker Samuel Conant Parks was appointed by Mayor Amoretti to apply to Mr. Carnegie for the $15,000 grant for the public library. Carnegie was building public libraries all over the United States. However, the money for the building was just the first step. There was a requirement for the county to commit public funds for the support of a library, and land needed to be acquired. A generous donation of land came from Eugene Amoretti. The formal groundbreaking for the library took place on August 1, 1907. The library was not completed until 1908. Adam Geismer was hired as the architect. Some of the design elements in the interior of the building consisted of a metal ceiling on the main floor to be painted to match the plastered walls. There was a reference room, librarian's room, stack room, and an assembly hall. The reading area of the library was arranged around a fireplace. Books were not loaned out until 1910. Up until then, users made themselves comfortable and settled in to read. More expensive materials and construction methods were used on the main floor, while the plans for the lower level were more conservative. Previous librarians have said that one librarian lived in the basement. She loved cats and kept several in her apartment. But the result was unpleasant as the basement began to smell and offended those who met in a room known as the Ladies' Assembly Hall. After the librarian left her job, the apartment was never again offered as part of an employee's benefits. This building contains what is left of the Amoretti Bank, the first bank in Lander. The only thing remaining of the original bank is the front facade. Over the years, much of the interior of the building was demolished and a second story was added, but the red sandstone pillars are what remains of Amoretti's bank. Even though the building did not survive, the bank itself did and has changed locations, owners, and names, and is currently still in existence. At first, the bank was simply known as Amoretti's Bank, then becoming Amoretti and Sons. Its true beginnings started with the Eugene Amoretti store and then moved into this stone building. Eugene Amoretti Sr. was a well-educated immigrant from Italy. He was ambitious and had an aptitude for business. Some of his business ventures included mining, mercantile stores, real estate, livestock, and banking. He was instrumental in getting the Lander Mill established, owned interest in the Lander Electric and Power Company, and pushed to get the railroad into Lander. He was elected first mayor of Lander and served in the legislature. During Harold Park's oral history, he was asked how Eugene Amoretti Sr. started the bank. He explained that Mr. Amoretti was running his store, and quite often the stockmen would give him their money for safekeeping. If they needed a sack of flour or a side of bacon or some salt, he would charge them for it. If there was money at the end of the month, he gave it back to them. Finally, someone said, well, you are in the banking business, why don't you start a bank? 
Mr. Amoretti said, how do you start? Someone told him to paint a bank sign on a board and hang it up. In the oral history, it was revealed that the bank did not have a vault. The money was placed in tin cans and buried in the basement. Eventually, of course, several vaults were established in the bank. This large brick building at the corner of 2nd and Main Street is known as the International Order of Oddfellows Building and was built in 1886. The Masonic organization funded the construction of this building so they would have a meeting hall. They held their meetings upstairs in a large hall, which was reported to be handsomely furnished and supplied with electric lighting appliances. The International Order of Oddfellows originated in England in the 1700s, some say as an offshoot of Freemasonry. It came to America in the early 1800s. The society's symbol or emblem is the chain with three links, meaning friendship, love, and truth. The Oddfellows are also known as the Three Link Fraternity. On the peak of this building, the date 1886 is visible along with the Three Links. One of the earliest businesses to use the ground floor was James Patton's Drugstore. In 1887, the Fremont Clipper reported the owner carried an immense stock of drugs, toilet articles, and druggist sundries. An efficient pharmacist is at all times found in attendance, and prescriptions are carefully compounded. Later, the building became the Golden Rule Store, a general store. It had an upstairs bowling alley during that period. It was also the Stock Growers Bar and has been several restaurants. This unique ornamental building was built in 1893. Built by Thomas J. Bossert as a dry goods store, he ran it as a cash-only store, advertising clothing at lower prices than ever offered in Lander. Today, the name Bossert is still clearly visible at the top of the building. In his ads in the newspaper, he said, Price goods elsewhere, then call on Mrs. T.J. Bossert, and you will be surprised at her low prices. This was when shoes were selling for $2, and fine imported dishes were 25 cents. In 1905, Bossert got out of the mercantile business, and H.W. Houghton and Company took over, continuing as a dry goods store. In the teens, the building was converted to a theater and ran as the Grand Theater until the larger Grand Theater was built across the street. It showed silent movies and held live performances. Through the years, the building has also been a Piggly Wiggly grocery store, a pool hall, a saddlery, a print shop, restaurants, and today, a bakery. The livery stable was a critical part of early pioneer communities, and Lander had several of them. Most sold and rented horses and wagons, fixed wagons, did blacksmithing, sold grain, harnesses, shaps, and whatever else was needed. William Lorenzo Vaughn was from Illinois, coming to Lander at the age of 22. He made his living as a rancher and then went into the livery business. Prior to building this large brick stable in 1891, he had smaller operations, boarding horses. There was a saddle shop associated with the livery, which for many years was run by noted Lander saddle maker, John Buckley. The stable was made from Lander bricks, but was later stuccoed over. This building on Main Street is one of the oldest structures in the valley. This log building was made from logs moved in from Camp Stambaugh near South Pass City. Camp Stambaugh was built by the U.S. Army in 1870 to protect miners in the Sweetwater Mining District. The camp was decommissioned in 1878, and many of its log buildings were sold and moved to other parts of Fremont County. This building was built from logs from some of the fort's buildings. Charlie Harrison built the building in 1880 and ran a meat shop there until 1886. Winfield Scott Firestone was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1858. He grew up in West Virginia and Missouri, where he learned the trade of cabinet maker. H. Rasmussen, who had furniture stores in Rollins and Lander, hired Firestone to come west to work for him. In those days, most furniture stores also served as undertakers, since they could build coffins as well as furniture. Firestone started in Rollins, but was offered a partnership to come to Lander to run the store, which he did in 1886, opening his store in this building. He married Mary Elizabeth Knave before leaving Rollins, and the two of them came to Lander. The Lander business flourished, and Firestone's obituary from 1933 said, Firestone had one of the leading business houses in the community. Mr. Firestone was an undertaker, 
and this connection rendered many thoughtful services in times of sorrow. As the years came and went, he was never idle. In all of the community activities that looked towards the advancement of the town, he took a leading part. Firestone served as mayor of Lander for two terms and was also on city council. The Noble Hotel. H.O. Barber was born in Ohio, came to Fremont County around 1906, where he was the freight agent for the railroad at the depot in Shoshone. He opened a small coal mine in Hudson, which later became a major mine. Barber also owned the Hudson Lumber Yard. He made significant money from coal, but also realized the tourism value of Lander's proximity to Yellowstone. He had the idea for an exclusive hotel and was principal partner in the Noble Hotel. He convinced the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad to assign Pullman cars to get wealthy tourists to Lander, where they would stay at the exclusive hotel, then take motor coaches to the park. Barber partnered with banker Fred Noble, who wanted the hotel named for his only son Everett, who had died at a young age from appendicitis. The luxury hotel was completed in 1918. In addition to the rooms, it also housed a bank, the Western Union office, other professional offices, and a drugstore. In 1929, Harold Del Monte, who had worked at the bank in the hotel, bought the hotel. He was an avid historian and wanted the hotel to give a brief but true synopsis of some of the exciting events of the early West as they influenced the town of Lander and the surrounding Wind River country. The rooms were decorated with Western themes like the Pony Express, Lewis and Clark, the Mountain Men, and others. Del Monte commissioned Montana artist J.K. Ralston to paint a series of paintings about the life of Chief Washakie. These hung in the hotel dining room for many years and are now on exhibit at the Lander Museum. He also had Western-style furniture, Native American artifacts, a grand fireplace, mounted big game heads, and a huge aquarium filled with live trout. In 1945, a writer said, as you step inside, you are immediately in the spacious living room of a motion picture mountain lodge. The hotel closed in 1969 due to changing tastes and easier access to the national parks. The National Outdoor Leadership School moved into the abandoned hotel in 1975, and today it is a vibrant hub of activity. Knowles refurbished the building, keeping much of the original feel and decor. This is one of the early brick buildings in Lander, and probably the oldest building still standing on Main Street. Built before 1886, it was made from Lander bricks. It housed Shoes Barbershop, a popular stop for cowboys needing shaves and baths. It was also the site of one of Lander's most infamous murders. On an April morning in 1890, Isaac Sullivan, the pharmacist at the nearby Palace Pharmacy, was getting his morning shave. Dr. Julia Schulke walked into the barber shop and accused Sullivan of besmirching his reputation by saying the prescriptions he ordered were bad. Schulke, originally from Germany, was considered a brilliant doctor, although prone to drinking heavily. The pharmacist and doctor argued, then Schulke pulled a pistol and shot Sullivan between the eyes in front of the astonished barber. Schulke was arrested for murder, but soon released, since he was considered a better doctor drunk than any man in the country sober. Lander area farmers began a push for a flour mill in the 1880s. Grain was grown in great quantity in the valley, but it had to be shipped to Rollins to be made into flour, an expensive and time-consuming trip. In 1888, a local group of citizens and farmers offered $3,000 to anyone who would build a roller mill in the area. J.D. Woodruff took up the offer, and having the parts shipped on freight wagon, built the mill in 1888. The first source of power was a water wheel. Water from the river was diverted to a mill pond which powered the wheels and shafts. The only problem was the water froze in the winter, so the mill was converted to steam boilers powered by crude oil from the nearby Dallas Dome oil field. Later, the power was produced by coal. The mill produced enough excess power that the extra electricity was sold to the city of Lander for use by the citizens, making Lander the second city in the state to have electric power. Woodruff got out of the mill business in 1900, selling the mill to Eugene Amoretti Sr. The mill greatly improved the market for local flour, and the Wyoma brand, as it was called, was popular. Farmers produced more wheat, so storage became an issue. Originally, the wheat was shoveled into the basement pit, 
but as production increased, more storage was needed. In 1927, a large elevator tower was built to store the excess. With the railroad tracks right besides the tower, the operators could move the grain from the tower to railroad cars to send to market. The production of flour, cereal, and grain for livestock made the mill a successful business. In 1928, the mill became the first franchise dealer of Purina Chow's livestock feed in the state. The two-story building is the Noble and Lane Building, which was the home to a mercantile business built in 1891. The stone building next to it was the Noble Lane and Noble Bank, built in 1892. The original facade of the two-story building was very ornate, but the bank building still resembles what it originally looked like. At the age of 21, Warden P. Noble came to Wyoming from Sackett's Harbor, New York, and opened a business in Atlantic City, which he operated for a year before becoming a freighter. In 1880, he became a licensed Indian trader and opened a store at the Shoshone Agency near Fort Washakie. He and his brother-in-law, Albert Lane, opened a mercantile in Lander in 1885 on this lot, building this building on the site of the original store in 1891. The building was praised in the Lander newspaper, which described it as, the entire lower floor will be occupied as a general sales room. Above, there will be two sets of offices in front, and in the rear, a meeting hall with two rooms for lodging purposes. The contractor states the building is an $8,000 structure. The building will be a great ornament to the street, and people will be exceedingly glad to learn that Noble and Lane have decided to take such a step. Noble's younger brother, Fred, came west from New York to join them, and the bank building was built and became the Noble Lane and Noble Bank, the second bank in Lander. This is the Baldwin Trading Post, built in 1884. Noyes Baldwin was originally from Connecticut. He went to California during the 1850s gold rush, sailing with his family around the Cape. From there, he moved to Nevada, where he ran a hotel. When the Civil War started, he raised a cavalry company, the 1st Nevada Cavalry, and was promoted to Major, a title he kept for the rest of his life. He ended up posted at Fort Bridger in Wyoming Territory, leaving the military in 1866. He then became an Indian trader, settling on the banks of the Papoja near today's Hudson. When the gold boom hit at South Pass, he opened a store there, then built a new Indian trading post just north of today's Lander traveling back and forth between the two businesses. Noyes and his wife Josephine had several children as they moved around the country, but their son George was born in Baldwin's cabin in 1869, the first white child born in the Lander Valley. As Lander became a thriving community, Baldwin and his family moved permanently to town, building an impressive stone general store at the corner of 3rd and Main in 1884. The Baldwin store began as a general store and carried a little bit of everything, clothing, hardware, groceries, dry goods. There was a butcher shop attached for fresh meat. The business stayed in the Baldwin family until 1995. Over the years, most of the original stone was covered with brick, except for a section on North 3rd, and a second story was added. This is the Coulter Block building built in 1907. William N. Coulter was born in Burlington, Iowa in 1849. As a young man, he headed west to California to join the gold rush, then to the gold fields in Nevada. He came to the Lander Valley in 1884 and opened the OK Saloon. A few years later, he built a large frame building called Coulter's Hall at the corner of 3rd and Main. This building had an ice skating rink in the winter and a performance space called the Opera House, where social and community events took place, as well as musical and dramatic performances. This building burned down, and Coulter got into the hotel business, building the Coulter Block in 1907, which, right across from the train depot, did a booming business. Meals were provided with rooms, and for an extra 25 cents, you could get a hot bath. Later, the building was known as the Wayne Hotel. Coulter died in 1926, and his obituary read, he was a square shooter, honest and fair-minded, agreeable in business. His word was as good as his bond. All are glad they knew William Coulter, and none say ill of him. This building was the Lander Mercantile Company and Wa Lee's Laundry and Bathhouse. John Dwight Woodruff was one of Lander's earliest pioneers and started several Lander businesses. Born in New York in 1846, he later headed west for the gold boom in Colorado. 
From there, he came to the South Pass area, then on to the Bighorn Basin, where he got into the sheep business, becoming what one newspaper called the Mutton King. He made an enormous fortune in the sheep industry. Woodruff moved to Lander in 1888 and built a fine house on 3rd and Lincoln Streets. He branched out, buying this building from Eugene Amoretti and opening a general mercantile store known as Woodruff's. He invested also in the Lander Mill. He began building a new larger building further up Main Street, and once that was finished, sold the building, which then became a Chinese laundry. Lander had a small but vigorous Chinese-American community, and a man named Wa Li ran a laundry and bathhouse in the building for many years. He also sold curios and silk and other items imported direct from China. Later, it was Jerry Sheehan's garage and Ford dealership. This is the Lander Commercial Company building. J.D. Woodruff's new building in the 300 block of Maine was a large two-story brick building built in 1890. The first floor was the store, and a large meeting hall was on the second floor. It could only be reached by a set of stairs on the outside of the building. The building was finished just in time for the Wyoming Statehood Ball, which was held in the meeting hall in November of 1890, with most of the town of Lander crowding into the room for the festivities. The citizens of Lander had been trying to get a rail line to the valley since the town was created. The Lander Valley was very isolated, and everything had to be freighted in by wagon from Casper, Rollins, or Green River, a long, dangerous journey that could take over a week for a round trip. Finally, in 1905, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad decided to put in a line from Nebraska to Lander, with a plan to continue the line over South Pass to California. The discovery of abundant coal near Lander, the development of the oil fields and tourism, plus the opening of much of the Wind River Reservation to white settlement was enough economic incentive to bring the railroad to Lander. The coming of the railroad created a boom for Lander, which continued to grow well into the 1920s. The plans to extend the line westward never happened, so the cowboy line, as it was called, ended in Lander, which came to be known as the town where the rails ended and the trails began. The first train arrived in Lander in October of 1906, greeted by much of the population of the town. The depot was built in 1907. This building is all that is left of a much larger complex. There was a large ticket and waiting area, a freight and luggage building. Further down the tracks was a water tower, corrals to hold cattle and sheep for shipment by rail, a roundhouse and turntable to turn the trains around for their return east. Thank you for joining us today on our latest Wind River Visitors Council Adventure Trek, Historic Main Street Lander. Be sure to join us in the future for virtual tours of historic sites, and hopefully by next year we'll be able to do these tours live. Thank you for joining us.